This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. One thing that you figure out pretty quickly in medical school is that the people who really teach you about the diseases are the patients. And assuming the same applies to many medical school, um, let's begin our discussion of Alzheimer's disease with the case history of Miss A.D. She's a 51-year-old homemaker, and she's suffering from progressive memory impairment. And though memory impairment is her main problem, she also has a host of psychiatric symptoms. She's developed paranoid delusions, she's agitated, her sleep is disrupted, and occasionally she engages in hoarding. And this has prompted a neurologic evaluation. And the neurologist who sees her notes that um, she is disoriented to time and place, that she has extremely poor memory for personal events, really can't remember things even a few minutes later. Um, when he asks her very simple questions, her responses are tangential and at times completely incoherent. And clearly she sees that something is going on with her mind because she, as many patients do, uh, repeatedly mutters during the examination, I have lost myself. What I haven't told you yet is that this encounter took place in a hospital in Frankfurt 110 years ago. And the patient was uh, Augusta Dieter, shown here, the first known patient with Alzheimer's disease, and the neurologist slash psychiatrist slash neuropathologist, uh, physicians were true Renaissance men in those days, um, was Alice Alzheimer. And Alzheimer was incredibly intrigued by Augusta D. Um, and her, what he called her disease of forgetting. He uh, continued to follow her even after he transferred to a hospital in Munich stayed in touch with the clinicians who were treating her, and after she died in 1906, he uh, performed a brain autopsy, and he was uh, struck by what he saw in the neurons or brain cells. Um, this is actually Alzheimer's own sketch, and these uh, circular structures are the nuclei of the neurons, and these are the tangles that he saw um, in the neurons in her brain. Um, and. Uh, so Alzheimer reported the first case of Alzheimer disease in 1906 at a conference and published it a year later. And um, this is a more modern uh, uh, view of what Alzheimer probably saw when he looked under the microscope. This is a brain specimen from a patient with Alzheimer's disease, uh, stained uh, in a special way to demonstrate the two core features of the disease that Alzheimer described in his seminal paper. Um, these uh, round structures that you see here, they almost look like flowers with a dense central core, are called amyloid plaques. And we know now um, they're in the extracellular space, they're not in the cells, and we know that they're largely composed of a protein called amyloid beta that I'll refer to from now on as A beta. And um, these flame-shaped structures that you see here are the tangles that Alzheimer drew. They're actually in the neurons themselves they're called neurofibrillary tangles, and we know now that they are composed largely of a protein called tau. So um, this was Alzheimer's disease of forgetting, and actually it's hard to believe now, but for much of the 20th century, this was a forgotten disease. Uh, it was considered a rare, obscure cause of dementia in young people, and it really wasn't until the 1970s that people put together that, in fact, the majority of people who developed dementia in late life had the same pathologic changes in their brain that Alzheimer had described at the turn of the century. And, of course, now we know that not only is Alzheimer's disease the most common cause of dementia, but it's an incredibly common disease. And, in fact, in the year 2011, Alzheimer's disease um, has us on the verge of a public health crisis.
There are five million Americans affected with Alzheimer's disease. And what you see here is a map of the United States um, with color coding representing the expected increase in the number of Alzheimer patients by the year 2025. And you can see that in California, we're in the second tier, we're expecting something between a 50 to 80 percent increase in Alzheimer patients. And this is actually a conservative estimate. Some people have estimated that the number of patients nationally will actually quadruple to 20 million by the year 2020. This, of course, translates not only into a lot of human suffering, but also into tremendous expenditures for our health care system. And the current uh, estimate is that Medicare has spent $172 billion in Alzheimer's care in the year 2010, and that will go to up to a trillion dollars by the year 2050. A treatment, and you'll hear more about this from Dr. Boxer, but a treatment that could even delay the onset of the disease by five years would make a tremendous impact. And yet, Alzheimer's, even though it is so far behind the other medical challenges that face our society, like heart disease and cancer, receives only a fraction of the research funding of these other diseases. Now, to understand why Alzheimer's is so common, let's think about what are the risk factors for the developing the disease. And the number one risk factor for developing Alzheimer's disease is getting old. So, so um, about 1% of people in their early 60s um, have Alzheimer's disease, and that roughly doubles every five years. And so by the time you're talking about people in their late 80s, early 90s, this is an incredibly common disease, affecting 35 to 40% of people. Women seem to be at higher risk, even controlling for the fact that they live longer than men. And if someone has a first-degree relative that's been affected by the disease, that does seem to increase their risk over the general population. How much is debatable, but somewhere around fourfold, perhaps. A history of head trauma seems to increase the risk of the disease, and there's a lot of interest in this now in professional sports and in the military. And then older people who are less mentally and physically active seem to be at increased risk for developing Alzheimer's disease. Now, this is a little bit of a chicken and egg problem because it's not clear if these elderly people are becoming less active because they're in the early stages of dementia or whether there's a true cause and effect. But there's more and more data now to suggest that the level of cognitive activity and physical activity in someone's 40s can determine their risk of Alzheimer's disease 30 or 40 years later. So I think that's pretty compelling uh, argument for cause and effect. And then everything that's bad for the heart is bad for the brain. And so all the vascular risk factors that plague our society, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, obesity, smoking, um, heart disease, all of these are independent risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. Now there are some things that seem to decrease people's risk and one of those factors is education. So this is probably good news for most people in the audience, though the bad news is that beyond 12 years of education, it's actually kind of diminishing returns. So <laughs> all those college loans or that mini med school uh, fee are not well spent, at least uh, in this regard. Um, more good news, a little alcohol might actually be beneficial, sort of like the story with the heart. One or two glasses of red wine at night might actually decrease the risk of dementia. And the corollary of what I said earlier, so people who are more mentally and physically active, and this seems to be true throughout the lifespan, are at decreased risk of Alzheimer's disease. And then eating healthy is very important, and the current diet uh, that's popular in, in the field is the Mediterranean diet. So lots of fruits and vegetables, olive oil instead of butter, chicken and fish instead of red meat, that sort of thing. <clears throat> now about 1 to 5 percent of patients have a familial form of the disease that is caused by a single gene mutation that is passed on from one generation to the next. And people in these families typically develop symptoms even in their 30s or 40s. The most common gene mutation associated with familial Alzheimer's are mutations in this gene called presenilin-1, which is on chromosome 14. 
And then there are more rare uh, mutations in a gene called APP and presenilin 2 And I'll show you a cartoon in the next slide that might explain why gene mutations in these particular genes might lead to an early onset Alzheimer's. The vast majority of cases are sporadic or non-familial. And the number one genetic risk for developing sporadic Alzheimer's disease is the apolipoprotein E genotype. ApoE is a gene that's on chromosome 19. And the product of this gene is very important in lipid or fat metabolism, in the way the brain responds to injury. And this is fairly simple genetics that even I can follow. So there's three genotypes in the population. And everyone has two copies. So most people have two copies of the E3 gene, which is the most common one in the population. If you have an E2 gene, you're probably protected, actually, against Alzheimer's disease. And the E4 gene is the one that's bad. That's the one that increases your risk of the disease. And if you have two E4s, you're at particularly high risk. And what seems to happen is that each E4 allele decreases the age of onset by about 10 years. And so if the rest of your genetic and environmental milieu has predestined you to develop Alzheimer's at age 80, but you also have two copies of the E4 gene, you might develop symptoms at age 60. Now, uh, 23andMe, and, and there, you know, there are a fair number of companies now that will offer genetic testing for a number of genes, including APOE. And I'm going to strongly recommend that people not get tested for this gene. And the reason is that at least, or about half the people who develop Alzheimer's don't have the ApoE4 gene. And many people who have an E4 gene never develop Alzheimer's disease. And so this gene, we almost never test for it clinically. It doesn't really provide any determinant information. Now that we have more sophisticated uh, genetic uh, statistical ways of detecting genetic signal, there are a number of other genes that appear to be of interest. But in every study that's done, APOE is far and away the strongest genetic effect on Alzheimer's. OK, so to really understand what causes the disease and where we are understanding the disease and with treatments, I think we have to get our hands a little bit dirty with molecular biology here. So please be patient, and I'll try to walk you through this slide. This is a cartoon of what people believe are the initial important events in the genesis of the disease. And what you see here in yellow is a cell membrane. So this is the extracellular space, and this is um, the intracellular space in a neuron. And this is a protein called amyloid precursor protein, or APP. And it sits really across the membrane and neurons. And its normal function is actually not known. There are several hypotheses about it, but it's not definitively known. What is clear is that APP has two possible fates. The first is cleavage by a protein called alpha secretase right here. And that's ge that generates this secreted waste product that actually the brain can get rid of pretty efficiently. The alternative fate, however, is cleavage by a protein called beta secretase here in the extracellular space, and a second cleavage event by a protein called gamma secretase right here in the membrane. And when these two steps happen, that generates a fragment, or what we call a polypeptide, a protein fragment that consists of 40 or 42 amino acids. That's this blue thing here. Amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. And especially the 42 amino acid version of A-beta tends to be sticky. So these protein fragments tend to stick to each other. Initially, they form two, three, four proteins stuck together as an aggregate. Um, these are all in solution. And these small aggregates are called oligomers. And they probably are the bad actors in Alzheimer's disease. They're highly neurotoxic. And then eventually, the aggregates stick to make the big plaques that we can actually see under the microscope. And so the amyloid hypothesis of Alzheimer's disease states that if you make more of the sticky A-beta than you can clear, then eventually you develop plaques and neurotoxicity, and that that's the initiating step in the disease. Now, I've told you that all the genes in humans that cause Alzheimer's diseases are genes either, or mutations either in this APP gene, 
or in presenilin, which is part of the gamma secretase complex that performs the second cleavage step. So you can immediately imagine how mutations that increase the tendency to form the sticky fragment would lead to early aggregation, early plaques, and uh, familial Alzheimer's disease at a young age. So the amyloid hypothesis has gotten a lot of bad press recently, but it's still, I think, the most viable theory for why, what causes Alzheimer's disease. And there, the reason it's viable is that there really are a lot of data to support it. So the first piece of evidence is that these aggregates of A-beta are highly toxic to neurons, to glia, the supporting cells in the nervous system. They, these uh, A-beta aggregates do bad things to synapses or the connections between the neurons. Also, all the mutations that cause familial Alzheimer's disease are mutations either in the amyloid precursor protein or in the presenilin protein that cleaves APP to form these A-beta fragments. And in fact, if you express these gene mutations in mice, the mice develop plaques and memory problems. They get Alzheimer's disease. <laughs> That's not my invention, so I won't take credit for that. Um, furthermore, people who have three copies of the APP gene People who have Down syndrome, they have three copies of chromosome 21, and APP is on chromosome 21, develop Alzheimer's disease in their 40s. And even genes that modify the risk of sporadic Alzheimer's disease, like APOE and the other genes, all of these genes are involved in the amyloid cascade. So the genetic data to support amyloid as an important factor in Alzheimer's disease are really overwhelming. But remember that when I showed you Alzheimer's first drawings, he was actually more impressed by the tangles than the plaques. The tangles are, consist of a protein called tau. And unlike APP, whose normal function is not known, we actually understand what tau does in the neuron. And it serves a very important role. Tau, shown here, binds to microtubules. And microtubules are a critical part of the cell's cytoskeleton, the skeleton of the cell. You can see here a neuron, and here it's microtubules. It gives the cell structure. And more critically, these are the highways through which um, nutrients, proteins, genes, DNA, RNA are transported from the cell body and nucleus here down into the presynaptic terminal here. And if you think about these very long nerve processes in the nervous system, the cell is critically dependent on this highway system. Now tau binds to these uh, microtubules and it stabilizes them. What happens in Alzheimer's disease is that tau becomes biochemically modified. What you see here, these T's and S's represent uh, sites on tau where a phosphate atom can be added or deleted. And in Alzheimer's disease, lots of phosphates are added to tau. It becomes what we call hyperphosphorylated. And as a result, it disassembles from the microtubules, and the microtubules become unstable. This is like closing down the Bay Bridge. This is really bad news for the cell. You can't transport things down to the synaptic terminal. And so, there are people who believe that tau is really the critical protein in Alzheimer's disease. Tau serves an important role, which is lost in Alzheimer's disease. And when it disassembles from the microtubules, tau begins to aggregate eventually into the tangles, but just like um, beta amyloid, initially into these small aggregates. And these aggregates are highly neurotoxic. Furthermore, the clinical symptoms of the disease correlate much better with the tangles than they do with the plaques. Even if you take an Alzheimer's mouse model, um, so a model, uh, an animal model that is genetically engineered to produce a lot of beta amyloid, but you silence the tau gene in that mouse, these mice have lots of plaques, but they don't have memory problems. Their memory is rescued by silencing tau. So even in a very artificial model that relies on A-beta overexpression, somehow the expression of tau is needed to have the symptoms. And the real reason that the tau hypothesis is gaining momentum is that amyloid-based therapies have failed to produce any benefit in clinical trials in Alzheimer's disease. And Dr. Boxer will probably talk about this. 
but as one amyloid therapy after another has failed, people are now turning to tau. Okay, so things are much more complicated than perhaps people thought when the amyloid hypothesis was first proposed in the 90s. And this is a cartoon showing some of the events again. Here is a neuron secreting these beta amyloid fragments. They're sticking together. They're forming these oligomers. The oligomers here are poisoning this dendrite, this antenna for this neuron here. They're poisoning this antenna here. They're forming plaques. And both the oligomers and the plaques are generating an immune response. These are very angry immune cells secreting these bad cytokines that Dr. Kramer talked about, I think, in his lecture last week. And these cytokines are further stunning the neurons. In the cell, people believe that the A-beta aggregates, through a series of molecular events that we don't yet fully understand, might be leading to hyperphosphorylation of tau and to the formation of tangles. The oligomers are poisoning the mitochondria, which is the energy cell here in the cell. APOE4 might actually have independent toxic effects. So there are a lot of events going on. And people think that it's probably naive to think that if you stop any one of these processes, the amyloid, the tau, the inflammation, you're going to cure the disease, that it's more likely that a cocktail of drugs that will each address different parts of this biology might be necessary to really control the disease. OK, so enough of molecules and proteins, and let's give the disease a human face again. Um, I think that um, Augusta D, the first patient, was really not a clinically, what we'd consider today a clinically typical case. And so I'll present a second case history. And this is Sergeant M, who I met in my senior year of residency at the Fort Miley VA. And Sergeant M was a 79-year-old right-handed veteran. He had diabetes and high cholesterol. And in sort of the understated way that a lot of veterans have, he came into the office and he said, boy, doc, my memory's just terrible. Um, but his wife uh, provided a richer history and said that for the past year, he had been forgetting conversations that they've had even 10 or 20 minutes later. He was forgetting TV shows that he watched the night before, who got voted off Dancing with the Stars, that sort of thing. Um, he was repeating himself, repeating the same old stories. Um, his memory for remote events was actually spared. And this is typical in Alzheimer's disease, and it throws people off. But people have a lot of trouble remembering recent events, yet can remember perfectly well events that happened 10, 15, 20 years ago. If anything, he was spending more time than ever reminiscing about the good old days. And Sergeant M was at baseline a very gregarious guy, sort of the life of the party. But now, especially in large groups, he tended to withdraw to the background. And last month, he was driving home to Ukiah from San Francisco from his endocrine clinic appointment. And this is a route that he had driven many times before. And he actually got lost on the way home and had to stop at a gas station and call his wife for help. OK, so the evolution of the disease doesn't happen overnight. This, um, people talk about things unfolding over um, a year, two years, three years, but we really think that this is a process that takes 10 or 12 years to unfold. And um, what happens is that people begin with this trajectory of normal aging. Now, we've heard from Dr. Kramer that um, some, cognitive, uh, some cognitive processes do change with age to some degree memory, but more processing speed and executive function. But what happens on the road to Alzheimer's disease is that memory often becomes disproportionately affected beyond what we would expect for age. And yet people don't yet have dementia. They're, do they're still functioning well in the world. They have a condition that I think Dr. Rosen introduced called mild cognitive impairment. And in mild cognitive impairment, people are still able to compensate for their memory deficits. They write post-it notes. They keep a meticulous calendar, a lot of to-do lists, and they continue to function independently in the world. And then at some point, their ability to compensate is lost. And this is what we call Alzheimer's dementia, when the decline in memory or other cognitive functions is not only beyond what we expect for age, but is already interfering with day-to-day -day function. So, um, You've learned already that the clinical symptoms that people have relate to the brain structures that are affected by the disease.
Dr. Rosen talked about the fact that the structure called the hippocampus and the temporal lobes is critically important for memory function. And in fact, this is the earliest target of Alzheimer's disease. What you see in this image are MRI scans from a single individual who was cognitively normal in 1993, developed mild cognitive impairment in 1997, 2001, and eventually developed Alzheimer's disease in 2003. And his hippocampus with an H is shown here in orange. His entorhinal cortex, this is part of the medial temporal lobe that receives connections from the hippocampus, is in yellow. And you can see that as he goes from being normal to having mild cognitive impairment to Alzheimer's disease, the hippocampus is shrinking. The entorhinal cortex is getting smaller. And this green area is spinal fluid in the ventricle expanding to fill that space. So hippocampal atrophy is a critical event in the disease. The disease also leads to atrophy in the cortex. This is a study by Adam Boxer, who you'll hear from in a few minutes, showing areas of the brain where cortical uh, gray matter is lost in patients with Alzheimer's disease compared to cognitively normal individuals. And if this is the front of the brain and this is the back, you can see that Alzheimer's disease is a disease that affects the back of the brain, the parietal lobes and the temporal lobes. And this is in contrast to frontotemporal dementia that you'll hear about in the next lecture from Dr. Seeley, which really attacks the front of the brain. So the symptoms correlate with the areas of the brain that are affected and their functions. You'll recall from previous lectures that the temporal lobes and the parietal lobes are very important for memory, in the left hemisphere for language, math, tool manipulation, and in the right hemisphere for navigation and spatial reasoning, precisely the symptoms that people have with the disease. Some areas in the lateral frontal cortex are also affected, leading to changes in executive function, but critically what is spared are the medial areas of the frontal lobe that you'll hear about from Dr. Seeley, areas that govern social behavior, and patients with Alzheimer's disease, even at advanced stages, are remarkably socially preserved often. And so this is what we look for as neurologists. We look for a pattern of symptoms that we translate into an anatomic pattern in the brain, and this is what allows us to make the diagnosis. A recent advance in brain imaging, and this is my research, lets us directly image some of the molecular pathology that's occurring in Alzheimer's disease. And this is a molecule called Pittsburgh Compound B, or PIB, developed at the University of Pittsburgh that binds to amyloid plaques. It's labeled with a radio uh, label that then sends off a signal that can be detected with a PET scanner. And what you see here is a PET scan. These red areas are areas of high activity corresponding to amyloid plaques in a patient with Alzheimer's disease. And this is a cartoon showing a patient, a PET scan from our lab of a patient with Alzheimer's disease compared to a normal control. You can see that the patient is showing a lot of binding in all the areas of the brain that we know have amyloid, whereas the control, so a lot of red signal, the control is showing a little bit of red signal which is nonspecific only in the white matter of the brain. Alzheimer's disease plaques and tangles also leave a signature in the spinal fluid. So you'll recall that the spinal fluid is floating in the ventricles in the brain and it's connected to the spinal fluid around the spine and with this infamous procedure that doctors perform called a lumbar puncture, a spinal tap, we can actually put a needle in this space for anesthesia or to get fluid. And in Alzheimer's, we see a change in the spinal fluid. We see a decrease in the levels of amyloid beta and an increase in the levels of total and phosphorylated tau. And if we translate that into a ratio, we can actually discriminate Alzheimer's patients from controls with very high accuracy. So this is another recent development, the ability to detect the pathology in live patients. So thanks to um, imaging, we can now image that plaques in live patients or live volunteers. These are three um, cognitively normal individuals in their 70s with the PIB scan or amyloid scan, and this individual isn't showing any red signal, but this individual is already just starting to show a little bit of yellow. And this individual, even though they're cognitively normal, is showing a lot of red signal, showing an amyloid burden that is actually similar to this patient with Alzheimer's disease. So we can actually detect the pathology in asymptomatic people, but is it having an effect on the brain?
And the short answer is yes. At a group level, people who have amyloid signal in their brain, even without symptoms, are showing shrinkage of the hippocampus, shrinkage of the cortex in exactly the areas that we know are affected by Alzheimer's disease. So thanks to um, these biomarkers and large collaborative studies that are now occurring around the world, we can begin to see the, evo the events of Alzheimer's disease unfold in patients during life and understand the disease much better. And this is um, a current model for what we think is going on in the disease. Um, as people go from being cognitively normal to developing mild cognitive impairment to developing dementia. This red curve indicates what most people think is the initiating event in Alzheimer's disease, which is the accumulation of beta amyloid. And you'll see that most of this accumulation is occurring while people are still cognitively normal, before they even have mild symptoms. And this can be detected with a PET scan or with spinal fluid. The next event is dysfunction of the neurons, which um, mediated by tau, and this translates into increases in tau levels in the spinal fluid and decreases in metabolism of the brain that can be measured with another imaging scan called an FDG scan. This is this blue curve here, and again, a lot of the action is going on before people have any symptoms at all. We can start to detect atrophy of the hippocampus and other cortical structures while people are cognitively normal, but this really takes off as people develop uh, increasing symptoms. And only at the end do people actually develop memory loss and other symptoms of the disease. And even later, do those symptoms actually lead to functional decline and impact day-to-day -day life? So right now, we are diagnosing Alzheimer's disease here, but all the action is going on here. And so we're missing a tremendous opportunity to intervene with all of these biological events by making the diagnosis so late. So we're redefining Alzheimer's disease in uh, the year 2011, and the redefinition is as follows. We recognize that the molecular events in the brain that I've told you about are probably occurring 10 or 15 years before people have even the earliest symptoms. That suggests, that's a little bit depressing, okay, but it also suggests that there's this huge window of time with which we can intervene with biologically specific treatments before brain atrophy has occurred, before all this destruction has occurred. Right now, we're diagnosing Alzheimer's disease when someone has dementia, and this is like diagnosing diabetes when someone is in, on dialysis. We've missed this tremendous opportunity to intervene before irreversible end organ damage has occurred. I think that these imaging and uh, body fluid biomarkers that I've talked about are increasingly going to be used in the clinic, but mainly in research in order to make an early and accurate diagnosis and also to gauge the effects of biologically specific treatment. And I'll stop here and Adam will pick it up from here in the third talk and tell you about some of these exciting treatments that are being developed. So thank you for your attention. I'm going to pick up here with a, a different story about a much less well-known disease called frontotemporal dementia, it's entitled this FTD 101. And uh, I think, you know, if, if Alzheimer's was recently considered rare, well, FTD was really not even on the map until the last 10 or 15 years. So I think um, here a lot of this will be unfamiliar material. I'll try to move you through it and capture for you some of the excitement that we as researchers in this field uh, feel these days as the, as the field begins to really accelerate in its pace of discovery. And I'm going to start like Dr. Rabinovich did with a patient. Um, this is a 58-year-old man, a, a business executive who has two children, so a, 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 young, a relatively young patient to be coming in with these kinds of problems. His wife actually insisted that he come to our clinic. Um, his own complaint was, uh, well, no complaint at all. He thought everything was going just fine. And yet, um, some changes had occurred in his day-to-day -day, uh, behaviors. And so I'll just kind of amplify these much less interested in things he used to consider highly uh, important, high priorities. So no longer willing to kind of pick up his kids from soccer practice, no longer interested in their report cards, um, just disconnected from those, those concerns. Um, 
he had developed some changes in the way he engaged in the social environment. So speaking up a lot, um, in an elevator with me, uh, I observed him to uh, turn his back to the door and uh, look at everyone's name badge, ask if they were married. Um, that was concerning. Um, <laughs> he had a routine where he would uh, circle the kitchen island every time he came into the kitchen and, and did that in a counterclockwise fashion, had to be counterclockwise. Um, and then he was also overeating and had a newfound uh, pension for sweets. Now, the striking thing about this patient and most others like him is that despite all this trouble, um, language, uh, planning, uh, skilled movement, navigation, memory, all these skills are totally normal. And yet, day to day, he just cannot hold down a job and his, his life is falling apart, his marriage is threatened. And um, this is really, I think, my <coughs> mental prototype for a patient with frontotemporal uh, dementia. Now, oftentimes these patients are misdiagnosed early on. This is thought to be a midlife crisis or maybe a little depression, um, some kind of a psychiatric illness. Um, but I'm going to convince you that this is not the case. This is the reflection uh, of a very specific kind of degeneration in the brain. Frontotemporal dementia is not as common as Alzheimer's disease. Um, but it is a common illness in patients who have an early age of onset, so who have symptoms of dementia occurring before age 65. FTD is probably just as common as Alzheimer's disease, if not more common in that age group. So we think it's a very important cause of dementia, in part because there are so many productive years ahead of these people. These are people with families who have uh, jobs, very active, vital members of, of society, and, and, and yet, you know, here they are at age of 40, 50, 60, median age of onset, right about 58 years of age for FTD. Um, the other thing to note about uh, FTD is that we don't know how common it is in patients over 70. We think a lot of these patients, when they present at an older age, are misdiagnosed as Alzheimer's disease. You can kind of get a feeling for what's going on in a field by doing a simple experiment where you type in some keywords into the PubMed search engine and see what you get back over a period of time. And that's what um, Dr. Miller did here in a slide that I borrowed. What you can see is that the amount of research going into Alzheimer's disease <coughs> compared to frontotemporal dementia, well, it's, it's a striking contrast. But I hope the other um, element of this slide that you'll appreciate is how much uh, the pace is accelerating in frontotemporal dementia. Look at the difference between the 90s and the, the first 10 years or nine years or so of, of, of this century, just a huge increase in the amount of um, peer-reviewed publications that are being written about this disorder. A few notes about it. Um, this is a progressive syndrome, just like Alzheimer's disease, except for that it doesn't start with subtle memory loss. It begins with social, emotional, or language disturbances, um, not memory or, or navigation. There's a very strong uh, genetic component with, with frontotemporal dementia. Um, perhaps 40% of patients have a strong family history. We think there are about 10% of patients overall who have a, a clear gene that's passed from one generation to the next. Um, the other thing about frontotemporal dementia is that it's a little bit of a mixed uh, bag. And that is, uh, there's a lot of overlap with movement disorders that have a Parkinsonian-like flavor. Um, for example, progressive supranuclear palsy, or PSP, corticobasal degeneration, or CBD. These are Parkinson's-like dementias. They're not Parkinson's disease, but they overlap with the frontotemporal dementias that I'll talk to you in more detail about tonight. Also, Lou Gehrig's disease, or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, um, which is a, a disease of motor neurons that causes progressive weakness, wasting of muscles. Very strong overlap with FTD, as I'll say more about shortly. Okay, so I am a brain imager and a neuroanatomist, but this is the amount of neuroanatomy I want you to know for tonight, okay? There's a front, there's a back, there's a left side, and there's a right side, okay? You can get that much, we're gonna be just fine. I am gonna show a few pictures of the brain, but this is the part I want you to hold on to. Just amplifying a little bit, now just a little bit more. In general, uh, the left side of the brain is concerned with verbal things, language skills. The right side of the brain, more emotional, more social. Front of the brain, representing the inside world. How do I feel right now? What does how I feel tell me about what I should do next to accomplish my own personal goals? So 
and to representing an internal uh, milieu, using that information to guide behavior. Back of the brain is about the outside world. What's going on in my environment? Who are the players here? Where am I? What am I doing? Um, those kinds of information, those bits of information that we take in through our many sense organs are represented in the back of the brain. And then anytime we want to re-experience those uh, perceptions and experiences, we use our memory system to basically light up the back of the brain again and bring those uh, percepts back into consciousness. So this is the anatomical framework. Okay, just a little bit more, not a lot. So more sophisticated. So one seed I'll plant for you is that the front of the brain and the back of the brain, well, sometimes they compete. Because when I'm thinking about the moment, I'm in my, I'm, I'm kind of sensitive to my emotional state, oftentimes I've turned off things about what's going on outside me, and this is kind of something that I think a lot of us are familiar with when we're caught up in a, thinking about a problem, we're kind of unaware of the outside world. So there's a little bit of a push and pull between the front and the back of the brain, and I'm going to explain why that's important. Okay. Here are my basic take-home messages about FTD. The FTD 101 must, must know this material kind of thing. This, is, this will be on your test. That's what the medical students would want to know. Um, so this is a common and probably underdiagnosed illness. That's uh, important. It's an, and it's a cause of mainly early age of onset dementia. Um, there are many forms of FTD, but the major forms um, present with either social and emotional deficits um, or with language deficits, and we'll, I'll say more about that. These are all due to specific circuits in the brain and are different from Alzheimer's disease. Um, frontotemporal dementia involves circuits in the front, Alzheimer's disease, a disease of the back, as, as Dr. Rabinovich highlighted. Uh, FTD is also associated with misfolded proteins, just like in Alzheimer's disease, but it's a little bit of a different story, and I'll highlight that in a slide or two. And, uh, and then there's this very strong link between Lou Gehrig's or ALS and FTD. Key points about FTD. These are the things that Dr. Miller taught me when I came here as a fellow. <laughs> um, so a slide to just tell you a little bit about the kind of confusing terms that surround this disorder. So frontotemporal dementia is actually a term we use as an umbrella or catch-all term to describe four major syndromes that I've shown you on the, on the slide here. So this, there's a behavioral variant, and this is the most common one, and here's a, a real picture of the brain. But what I want you to know about it is that th this is a um, disease more of the right hemisphere. You can see that readily. It doesn't take a neuroradiologist to say there's a problem on this side worse than this. Um, and it's, in the, it's affecting the frontal lobe and this structure here called the insula which I'll say more about in a minute. In the language variants, I think you can readily see that there's more trouble on the left. There's more space. This is cerebrospinal fluid that is replacing brain tissue that's been lost in these patients. And the result is that they've, they've developed specific kinds of language dysfunction. I think you've seen some videos, for those of you who've been in the earlier um, uh, sessions of this course, have seen videos of patients having these kinds of language dysfunctions. And in, in the interest of time, I'm going to spend most of my time highlighting patients like the one I started with, uh, Mr. FT, who have this behavioral variant of frontotemporal dementia. I just don't have time to cover all of these, but it's important for you to know for your test that, um, that there are these language variants, and they're, if you put them together, they're getting to be almost as common as this behavioral variant. The fourth point is that um, many of these patients come in with a progressive motor neuron disease, weakness and wasting disease of the muscles, and um, that, ha that carries a very uh, concerning prognosis when that happens, accelerates the progressive decline. So this is a slide I often use to, to um, teach researchers in this area about clinical pathological correlations in this illness because it is a little bit complicated. Um, now, with Alzheimer's disease, Dr. Rabinovich told you that uh, there are two major proteins, amyloid and tau. But they both occur in the same brains in, of each and every patient with this illness, with Alzheimer's disease. In FTD, it's different. Um, there are actually three major proteins, but they occur independently. So a patient who has frontotemporal dementia, one of these syndromes, will most often have frontotemporal lobar degeneration, a term we use to describe what we find uh, with the microscope at post-mortem analysis. Um, and usually, those patients have one of these three different proteins aggregating, sticking to each other inside nerve cells that's causing those nerve cells to dysfunction and ultimately die. But it's one or the other, not a combination. Now, uh, it is a little bit more complicated than this, and I'm not going to dwell on this aspect, but I just want to highlight for you that when we're looking at um, um, 
these uh, materials under a microscope and trying to make an autopsy diagnosis of frontotemporal lobe degeneration, we're actually considering a host of different subtypes within each of these major um, protein classes um, that are each a little bit different, and so this adds richness and complexity to what we're looking for. When we go about guessing what a patient will have at an autopsy, when we're seeing them for the first time in our clinic, this is what we're facing. It's a challenge for us. And um, in the talk about molecular um, biomarkers and molecular imaging, you can see where there's a real application here if we could harness the right strategy. When we see a patient with behavioral variant of frontotemporal dementia, we don't know whether it will be tau, whether the orange color, whether it will be TDP, the blue, or whether it will be this um, fuss protein, the green. So we don't have ways yet of making these predictions accurately for um, behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia, but we do know that it's likely not to be Alzheimer's disease. It's likely to be frontotemporal lobar degeneration. Um, and for some of the other disorders, you can see we do a little bit better. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the nitty-gritty in the biology. You heard a lot about tau from uh, Dr. Rabinovich. It's the same tau protein that's involved in microtubules um, that dysfunctions in uh, Alzheimer's disease. Interestingly, when you have a mutation in the tau gene on chromosome 17, you don't get Alzheimer's disease, you get FTD. So um, some of the patients with FTD definitely very strongly linked in, uh, to, to dysfunction and toxic aggregation of the tau protein. But about half of patients with, with FTD have dysfunction in a different protein called TDP43, shortened here to TDP. And the important thing to know about that protein is that it's the exact same protein that's sticking and aggregating in nerve cells in ALS, or Lou Gehrig's disease. So even at the uh, molecular protein level, FTD and ALS very strongly linked. Interestingly enough, this rare form of FTLD, less than uh, 5 or 10 percent, who have inclusions of this protein called FUS, well, FUS was actually discovered first through genetic studies of ALS. So again, another link at the molecular genetic level to uh, ALS. Okay, so I'm going to show you a picture now of a, of a, a post-mortem specimen from a patient who died of frontotemporal lobar degeneration with tau inclusion. And this is a patient who had a disease called Pick's disease, which many of you may have heard that term before. Pick's disease is a is a, now used to refer to a specific uh, neuropathology, a cause of frontotemporal dementia. But for a long time, uh, Pick's disease was a term used to refer to this entire class of disorders because Arnold Pick described these illnesses clinically at the turn of the last century. Now, here what you can see is that there are nerve cells that are not looking healthy. I think if you compare to this neighboring uh, neuron here in the cingulate gyrus, which I'll tell you about in a moment, this cell looks quite unwell. It's kind of portly, I guess, um, swollen, um, and its nucleus is shoved way up into this process here. This is a dendrite or one of the antennae of the cell, as uh, Dr. Rubinus described it, and it's, it's really not looking good. This is an accumulation of a tau protein that we've stained with a routine stain. You can see it pushing the nucleus out of the way. And then these are sta immunostains that we use on the tissues to highlight uh, the brown here, which is the bad stuff, and that's tau aggregating inside nerve cells and inside uh, glial cells, as I've shown you in these uh, star-shaped uh, accumulations of tau. So um, just an example of what this looks like under a microscope. Now I'll uh, shift gears and show you a, uh, an example of what uh, frontotemporal lobar degeneration with uh, TDP inclusions looks like. It's quite a different picture, I think. And you can see here these stains for TDP are highlighting these long um, nerve cell processes that have been jammed up and um, bogged down by accumulations of this protein. In some cases, it's accumulating just inside the, the cytoplasm of the, of the nerve cell away from the nucleus, and it's actually caused the, the normal nuclear TDP-43, which is living here in the, inside these unaffected cells, to clear, I think you can see how all these cells with this little glob of TDP here have no TDP in their nucleus, so that's important. Um, and then this is actually a, um, a motor neuron in a patient from ALS, same kind of inclusion, um, different cell type. Now the, the dirty secret that I've been keeping from you is that we're not yet good enough to 100% to exclude underlying Alzheimer's disease as a cause of one of these 
FTD clinical problems. So when a patient comes in with, for example, a progressive non-fluent aphasia, we, we know from autopsy studies that some of them will be, will be shown to have the same plaques and tangles that we heard about in the last lecture, um, just mimicking one of these FTD syndromes. So we're always looking for better ways to discriminate um, these diseases during life. Okay, so I'm going to come back to our patient here. And again, here's our visual cue as to what we're looking for. In FTD, we're looking for front of the brain, right, worst, and left. I think this patient, who I described at the outset, very nicely illustrates that principle. And what you can see here is that here in the right uh, side of the brain, there's been a loss of tissue along this edge here uh, that we refer to as the frontoinsular cortex. There's also been widening of these gaps between the, the, the brain tissue on the medial wall of the frontal lobe, the part most close to the midline, and it involves this structure that, that I mentioned a moment ago called the anterior cingulate cortex. So those are a couple of terms you're going to hear throughout the rest of the lecture, anterior cingulate cortex, frontoinsular cortex, very important structures in, in behavioral variant of FTD of the type our patient has. And you can see right worse than the left. Um, so we did a study to try to understand you know, can we watch the change happen in groups of patients who come in at different severities of this illness? Because unlike Alzheimer's disease, we don't have the luxury of, of detecting this illness by chance in large groups of healthy aging individuals. So we have to study patients in their early stages. And so this is what a normal brain looks like here uh, when, the patient has no, when a patient has no symptom or an individual has no symptom at all. When they come in, these are the structures I mentioned a moment ago, anterior cingulate cortex, frontoinsula. And when a patient comes in with the behavioral variant of FTD just beginning, hardly any trouble, you can see these yellow maps highlight areas of statistically significant brain cell uh, or nerve cell loss, shrinkage of the, of the brain tissue uh, here using MRI scanning. When the disease is a slightly more advanced, you can see it's fanning out in the same structures involving some new ones. And when a patient comes in with moderate to severe deficits, um, the illness is really throughout the front parts of the brain. But again, front more than back, left more, or right more than left. So that pattern uh, stimulated us a few years ago now to wonder whether um, frontotemporal dementia was targeting a network. And so if United Airlines was your disease, um, as, many, as for many of you, I'm sure it may be. Um, <laughs> this is the Bay Area. Uh, well, the first thing you'd want to know to try to cure your disease is, well, what, what, how does that um, disease work? What is the, how can I map it? And you'd, you'd ask for a copy of this, this diagram, which is the United Airlines flight map. And you would quickly detect, by looking at this map, that there are several key hubs. One of them is right here. You all know it well. So, oh, that's O'Hare. Here's Denver. This is San Francisco, of course. And the key principle here is that each of the sites where uh, United travels is a node in this network. And all these sites, which are highly densely interconnected with the other nodes, are called hubs. So these are key connector nodes that hold the network together, allow it to function. And when we were looking at this pattern of injury in the FTD brain, it started to really remind us of a network map that had been built through looking at normal brains. But we hadn't figured that out yet in healthy people. So we turned to a group of healthy young people who were undergraduates at Stanford at the time, and we paid them a little bit of money to lie down uh, in a scanner for a few minutes and have their brain activity measured. And what we did is we um, asked a simple question, which was, what is the activity uh, in the right frontal insular cortex that I mentioned? the same spot that was so atrophied in our patient, how does it fluctuate over that eight minutes of low-level paid employment? Um, <laughs> and that, that, that activity fluctuation is shown here. And then we asked an uh, equally simple question, which is, where are all the other regions in the brain who have a very highly correlated, similar uh, time series, we call it, um, uh, to our area of interest here in the right FI? And the idea here is that regions that are firing together are wired up together, and they form networks in the brain. And what we found when we, when we performed that experiment is that we found this spatial pattern of interconnected, functionally correlated brain regions that very closely mimicked the pattern of atrophy in the FTD brain. So to me, this was a very strong indication that we were onto a network-based disease 
And I'm just showing you the two patterns next to each other. This is atrophy in a group of patients now with a mild FTD. And this is the network of connected regions in the Stanford undergraduates. So you can see how similar these spatial patterns are when we put them next to each other. And then we took this further and asked whether this also applied to Alzheimer's disease and uh, the language variants of FTD. So these are, again, regions of uh, brain tissue loss mapped uh, with MRI uh, scanning. Uh, and this is you know, areas of atrophy. And then we, we asked um, about the right FI, showed you that data, and then we took these other peaks of atrophy in these different clinical problems and asked the Stanford data, to, the, the undergraduate data in the healthy brain to tell us whether there were networks corresponding to these other diseases, and sure enough, there were. So I'm going to focus my comments for the next few slides on these two networks because these are the two diseases we're talking about today. And again, they help us, uh, they help remind us about this uh, cartoon uh, guide to our anatomical model, which is that AD affects the back, FTD affects the front, and the two systems kind of compete with each other. And so what, what we did in an experiment published last year is we actually asked whether if we looked at the affected networks in in FTD, would they actually be better than normal in Alzheimer's disease, and vice versa? Because we figured if they're really in competition, then when you injure one, the other one ought to get better, and you injure the other, the, the one ought to get better. So this is what the data look like. Here, this is a, the, anterior, the frontal network called, that we call the salience network, um, uh, because it responds to those emotionally significant moments I mentioned. And uh, it's got all these blue-colored uh, reductions in the FTD patients compared to controls. This posterior network uh, involved in memory has these blue colored reductions compared to controls. When you look at the, at the flip-flop, when you look at regions where the Alzheimer patients are actually doing better than the controls, well, there are all these regions in the front of the brain, and the, uh, the FTD patients are actually doing an all, better in all these regions in the back of the brain. So this supports this sort of competing networks idea. And the good news for us about this from a clinical standpoint is that it means that the two patient groups are actually even more different from each other than either of them is from a healthy population. So that was great because what we wanted to do is to see if we could use this kind of network approach to distinguish between these patients um, during life. And sure enough, when we uh, kind of put a bar through here showing the separation, the difference between the two networks is actually the best predictor of which group you belong to. So these are the uh, Alzheimer patients up here, and uh, they have very low um, DMN connectivity, this posterior back of the brain network, and high um, act activity and connectivity in, in the front of the brain. So the difference makes, gives them a high score, whereas the FTD patients have a low score and the controls are kind of in the middle. So we're hopeful that this approach will continue to uh, bear fruit as we look for distinguishing biomarkers. The other thing we hope for is that the network mapping approach will allow us to follow disease progression. So here what I'm showing you is the correlation between um, regions within this frontal network called the salience network and the severity of symptoms in FTD. So the severity is going along the uh, x-axis, connectivity in this right frontal insular area on uh, the y, and you can see there's a very strong correlation there. Interestingly enough, the back of the brain, the worse the patient gets, the hotter it gets. So it gets more and more revved up, um, and we think this could be really important and interesting to follow up on. But what I really hope is that it will allow us to sort of have a dynamic marker for treatment response so that when we do get into clinical trials for FTD, and, and Dr. Boxer will talk about this, uh, we'll have a, a, a measure we can use. Okay, um, this is just briefly a, a study using a different kind of MR imaging technique called perfusion imaging, which found basically very similar findings to what we found uh, using the connectivity mapping. This is a different group, uh, different patients, same finding, uh, re reassuring for sure. Um, so if you were trying to solve the United Airlines problem and, and um, dig deeper into what was causing this network, this particular one, to break down, of course you would want to look in the hubs. Right, and so you, you'd probably start right there. And, and this is what it looks like. Uh, this is O'Hare Airport, the kind of road map. And you'd be digging around and you'd be wondering if it's that funky neon uh, walkway that's ca <laughs> causing stuff to break down. You'd be, you'd be thinking about the, the moving parts within that hub that uh, make it go so that you would be able to understand what makes the whole network uh, get into trouble when it does. And so these are the hubs in FTD. I'm not going to elaborate on this slide, but I'm going to say that a lot of research supports these being the hubs. 
And we've been digging deep into these guys because they're just so interesting. What I'm showing you on the right side of this um, slide here is a group of nerve cells called von Economo neurons. They're so peculiar to look at. I had never seen a neuron like this in medical school. And then when I got here to UCSF and started looking into this disease a little bit more, I learned about this peculiar looking group of cells and found out that interestingly enough, they were only found in these areas that are, that are affected in FTD. So we started really digging into this. And I'm just going to kind of try to tickle your imagination here and, and just scrape to the surface of the work we've been doing on this by saying that um, there's some really interesting features about these cells. One of them is that they're um, not ubiquitous in the animal kingdom. They're found in these extremely large brain species, so apes and humans, uh, cetaceans, which is a term used to refer to whales and dolphins, and then elephants, both the African and the Indian elephant have these cells. These are the brains of those species, really remarkable brains, put ours to shame for sure. We shall bear that in mind. Um, and uh, those are the only species known so far to have these kinds of nerve cells. When we look at them in patients who've died of FTD, what we find is that they correlate remarkably well with the severity of the atrophy in that disease and the severity of the, the clinical symptoms. So that's what's shown here in blue. The right-sided loss of these nerve cells is very highly correlated um, and better uh, correlated than the left uh, with the, the, with the um, severity of the s clinical symptoms. And when we look at the behavioral symptoms, we see a, a similar correlation where, again, the, the right-sided uh, nerve cell loss correlates best with the severity of the behavioral symptoms that the patient showed during life. The tau protein aggregates in this fashion in these cells. You can kind of get an image of why a cell looking like this wouldn't work well. The brown is misfolded, sticky tau, glogging up these von Economo cells. And the TDP43 protein has a similar pattern where it uh, is sticking together inside the cytosol. And again, you can see there's none left in the nucleus where it's supposed to be, like in this healthy von Economo neuron here. Brown is good, blue is bad in that scenario. In the cytosol, brown is bad and blue would be better, but not enough of it here because it's all crowded out by the brown. So I hope that little, little taste convinces you that we're starting to get a handle on what this disease is all about from an anatomical standpoint. We think that this, this key hub, the O'Hare of FTD, uh, is part of the breakdown. And we're looking uh, more and more closely at that issue because we hope that if we kind of build a more comprehensive model of how the disease works, we'll be able to direct treatments toward many of these different molecules and, and nerve cell types and try to restore function to these, um, these patients dealing with this devastating illness. So I'm going to stop there and thank you for your attention. I'm going to switch gears a little bit and I want to tell you a little bit about how we think we're going to cure these diseases. Um, I may be the eternal optimist, but I think that through the, the studies that my colleagues such as Dr. Rabinovich and Dr. Chile are doing, we're really learning a lot about Alzheimer's disease and frontotemporal dementia and we're identifying those key network nodes where we may be able to intervene and actually make people better or at least slow the course of, the, of these diseases to the point where they may not be such a big problem. Um, but what I want to start out with is sort of with um, telling you a little bit about um, our group here at UCSF and just to tell you that really I'm very focused on developing these treatments and really our goal is to, is to bring these latest and most exciting treatments here to San Francisco because I think we're really the trendsetters in the world and I think um, we need to really uh, protect our community and so our goal really is to advance the treatment of Alzheimer's disease in front of temporal dementia and to do it in an approach which really values everyone in our community and particularly thinking about the public health because unfortunately the way our healthcare system is set up, uh, much of the drug development efforts are uh, currently being led by pharmaceutical companies and so it's up to us in the academic community to really exert some leadership and, and think about what's best for our, our community and not necessarily the bottom line. So um, I think you've heard quite a bit about this already from Dr. Rosen in a past lecture and also from Dr. C uh, from Dr. Rabinovich. And I just want to give you a little bit of a, my view of, of what determines brain function. And so I think um, uh, I'm going to primarily uh, talk about Alzheimer's disease because most of our treatment efforts are really focused on Alzheimer's disease. Uh, but um, uh, at the end, I'm going to come back and tell you a little bit about our efforts in frontotemporal dementia.
So as Dr. Rabinovich uh, told you, um, most people get Alzheimer's disease. In fact, everyone starts out sort of in a situation where they're a healthy, normal adult. Uh, most people pass through this, this uh, syndrome called mild cognitive impairment where they may have some memory problems, but by and large they're able to manage pretty well in their day-to-day -day function. And then unfortunately some people will progress to get dementia or Alzheimer's disease where uh, these memory problems are so severe that they can no longer manage their day-to-day -day affairs. So just from a general perspective, what causes these types of problems? Well, we think that there are two sort of competing processes that are going on in, in an individual's brain that determines whether they will get dementia. And so one is sort of the accumulation of brain damage. You heard from Dr. Rabinovich that in Alzheimer's disease, you can have buildup of toxic proteins called amyloid, one is called tau. And um, as these accumulate in the brain, they get, you get more and more of this, and eventually this is somewhat correlated with whether or not you'll get dementia. The good news is, is that our brains are also um, pretty, pretty strong, and they have the ability to compensate for this damage. And so uh, we have uh, what we call cognitive reserve. And so this is our brain's ability to compensate for damage to maintain activity and to maintain the ability, even the set, in the setting of this damage, to function well. And so whether someone is healthy or has mild cognitive impairment or dementia, I'm going to tell you, is sort of a dependent on both of these factors, how much damage is present from these toxic proteins. And again, Dr. Seeley told you that in FTD we uh, think about tau and another protein called TDP43. But this is, this is counterbalanced by the brain's natural ability to resist this damage called cognitive reserve. And so um, when you're healthy, you may have very little brain damage and a lot of cognitive reserve. Some people will start to accumulate more damage, whether it be amyloid and tau or TDP43, but they'll still have enough reserve to maintain them in this cognitive, uh, this uh, healthy aging uh, scenario. Eventually, some people uh, may have the same amount of damage, but their reserve uh, declines for some reason. I'm going to speculate why that may be. And this causes them to, to progress into mild cognitive impairment. Other people may have a lot more damage in their brain, and yet um, they're able to uh, compensate this for this with more reserve and maintain themselves in this uh, MCI or mild cognitive impairment. And, but eventually, as the reserve declines, they may progress to dementia. So most of our treatment efforts now are focused on these toxic proteins, and that's really what I'm going to talk to you about today. And what we hope is that through using new technology, we're going to be able to roll back some of this damage or perhaps prevent some of this damage so that it doesn't accumulate in the first place and that, and that we all stay healthy uh, and not uh, develop these diseases. So this is a study from our colleague Christine Yaffe who looked at um, who uh, looked at uh, normal older people and split people into three groups uh, as to whether their memory got the, stayed the same over the course of eight years, got a little bit worse or got a lot worse. And we think that some of the things that she identified may be factors that help to maintain cognitive reserve. And so these are some of the same risk factors that Dr. Rabinovich just told you for Alzheimer's disease. So, how do you maintain your reserve? How do you age successfully? Well, first of all, don't get old. And unfortunately, none of us can do that. Um, spend lots of time in school. And I'm going to argue that you could even uh, spend more than 12 years in school. Um, read better than a ninth grader. Hopefully, many of us can do that. Don't smoke. Exercise. Don't be a caregiver. We know the stress of taking care of a loved one um, who's sick really uh, tends to accelerate uh, the, or be a risk factor for dementia. Have good social support, that is don't live alone. Um, work or volunteer. And drink a little alcohol, maybe. So again, um, I'm just going to review a little bit uh, about what Dr. Binovich already told you about Alzheimer's disease. But um, what he described to you is that uh, Currently, when one of us in our clinic uh, manages someone with Alzheimer's disease, uh, usually the patient or their family will show up saying, you know, I have a memory uh, problem. Um, we as physicians will do a series of tests. We'll measure their, their memory. We'll uh, get a picture of the brain and we'll do some labs to rule out other causes of memory problems. <laughs> And uh, then we may make a diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment if there's a memory problem but the person is still managing okay in their day-to-day -day life. 
or as, or as Dr. Rabinovich mentioned, uh, if this is really causing problems in their day-to-day -day life, we may call this Alzheimer's disease. Well, what can we do about this? Well, actually, even though we don't have great treatments right now, there are quite a few things that we can do to manage Alzheimer's disease and, and actually uh, improve quality of life. So first of all, we mentioned exercise. There's quite a bit of evidence that exercise really helps with behavior, helps with well-being in Alzheimer's disease, and we think this is something that is, that's helpful not just to people who are getting older, but people with memory problems. Dr. Rabinovich mentioned that what's bad for your heart is bad for your brain, and so we, t we try to minim minimize risk factors like diabetes, high blood pressure, um, other things like that. Uh, we also know that when you have a memory problem, there are other drugs that can get in the way of your brain function. So uh, certain things like uh, medications for uh, bladder control and things like that can actually make memory worse. And so if we remove these, uh, sometimes we see that people's memory will get better. We know that Alzheimer's disease is associated with depression in many people, and, and although, um, again, I'm, we don't have a great treatment for Alzheimer's disease, we can treat depression pretty well. And so this is another way that we can really improve quality of life and, and allow people with memory problems to do much better. Um, it's important that also we take care of the loved ones of someone who has a memory problem. And so we focus a lot on caregivers because you can't, uh, um, your loved one can't get uh, help if you yourself are not doing so well. So finally, what I'm going to tell you a little bit more about now are some of the medications we use to treat memory problems right now. And they fall into two classes. One's called acetylcholinesterase inhibitors and the, others are called, uh, the other one is called memantine. And um, I'd like to tell you that these uh, help a little bit with managing memory problems, but they're sort of like an engine treatment for a rusty old jalopy engine. So if you have Alzheimer's disease and your, the, your brain is an engine and it's getting rusty and the, the valves are, are sticking, you can make it work a little bit better if you clean it out with a Valvoline or change the oil. And that's what basically all of these medications do. And so um, the first three, Dinepazil, Rivastigmine, Galantamine, you may, you may recognize the trade names, all uh, boost a chemical called acetylcholine in the brain. And basically, although the drug companies will tell you one is better than the other, they all work about equally. There's another drug called a Nemenda or Memantine, which works in a different mechanism. And this also, again, helps the brain to function a little bit better. But by and large, still the damage due to these toxic proteins is still accumulating. So how do we know that these drugs work? Well, this is a slide from one of the early studies from um, Aricept or Dinepacil. And so um, this is time on the bottom axis here. Um, so over the course of 24 weeks, people with Alzheimer's disease either got a sugar pill or placebo. And those people, this is a memory test on, on the y-axis here, um, by and large their memory declined over 24 weeks. But when they got uh, the, the drug Dinepazil, it actually initially got a little bit better and then it stayed more stable over time. And so this really does help a little bit, but we know that um, it, it probably isn't treating the underlying pro uh, problem. And we know this for two reasons. Number one, um, if we follow people longer, what we see is that the people who got these drugs eventually begin to decline at the same rate as the people who got the placebo. And so the damage is just accumulating even though the engine is running a little bit more efficiently. The other thing we know is that if we acutely stop medicines like this, that the people who are getting the medicine will quickly uh, decline down to the level of the people who didn't get the medicine. And so again, we think we're not really treating the underlying problem, we're just making the brain work a little bit more efficiently. Does this mean that these drugs don't help and we shouldn't use them? Well, I would argue that they do help. And so this is uh, some work from Oscar Lopez um, where he looked to see you know, whether these uh, medicines, either the acetylcholinesterases or, uh, or inhibitors or memetine, help people to function at home better. And what you can see is that um, he f followed people for uh, over about 18 years and then uh, tried to assess how long were they able to stay at home in the face of Alzheimer's disease. And what you can see in the black here is that people who didn't take any of these medicines uh, had to go into a nursing home a lot more quickly than people who took either one of these cholinesterase inhibitors like Aricept 
or, um, and if they took memantine in addition, there was an added benefit, and so they could stay at home uh, even longer. So we think that although these medicines that we have available aren't perfect, they're not treating the underlying damage of Alzheimer's disease, they do help a bit, and they're useful to, for our patients. Um, Right now in our clinic, uh, again, we don't have any, uh, anything that treats the underlying disease, and so we also think about how to make people more comfortable with this uh, disease, with Alzheimer's disease, which is a terminal disorder, uh, but we hope that in the future this won't be necessary. Uh, so as Dr. Rabinovich mentioned, um, Alzheimer's disease is really a public health emergency. We think that by mid-century there will be at least 14 million people with Alzheimer's disease in this country and that this will lead to a cost of approximately $300 billion a year in health care dollars. Um, Although it's a big problem to think of a treatment that might actually treat the underlying toxic proteins of Alzheimer's disease, we don't have to have something that works perfectly. If we had something that could just delay the onset by two years, we could have a pretty big impact uh, many years later uh, in the number of cases and cost to society. If we had a, a treatment that actually delayed onset by five years, we could probably cut in half the number of cases by mid-century. And so I think this is a tractable problem. We're learning a lot about the biology of disease, and there's great reason for optimism. And so how are we going to do this? Um, well, um, again, uh, what Dr. Rabinovich told you is that we're starting to appreciate that with Alzheimer's disease and probably also with frontotemporal dementia, the changes, the biological accumulation of toxic, sticky proteins like amyloid and tau in the brain probably starts 10, 20, 30 years before anyone ever shows some, any symptoms. And so um, by the time someone goes into this mild cognitive impairment stage, they've been accumulating toxic proteins in the brain for some time and eventually they will then uh, decline into getting Alzheimer's disease. Well, what we think we're going to be able to do with technologies such as the brain scans that Dr. Abinovici showed is that we'll be able to detect people before they have any symptoms, but when they're starting to have uh, some of the toxic proteins build up. And then we'll have new types of treatments that we call disease-modifying treatments that can hopefully block the accumulation or hopefully even remove the accumulation of these toxic proteins so that we prevent people from declining into Alzheimer's disease or other forms of dementia. So just to remind you, uh, I, I think you've seen this picture in a different way before. In Alzheimer's disease, there are these amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles under the microscope, and the amyloid plaques are made of a protein called amyloid, and the neurofibrillary tangles are made of a protein called tau, and we're working on treatments that we hope will have effects on both of these types of protein. Um, Dr. Abinovici stole my joke, so I have a <laughs> bone to pick with him. But um, so uh, actually, this wasn't my, Alzheimer's. Actually, will credit Dale Bredesen, one of our other colleagues, with this. But. Um, We've been able to develop new treatments for Alzheimer's disease and now more and more frontotemporal dementia because we can recapitulate the disease by introducing genes into mice um, and we can create something called Mousheimer's. And in fact, we can cure Mousheimer's. We've been able to cure Mousheimer's probably for about 10 years now. But really our challenge is to take our cures for Mousheimer's and translate them into human cures. And this is what I'm really focused on. So again, this is a, a different view of, of one of the pictures that uh, Dr. Rabinovich showed you, but um, this is sort of all of the different targets in a cell that we are developing treatments towards. These are the different molecules that we think we're going to be able to intervene and cure the underlying disease hopefully one day. So again, this is a blown up picture of a cell. This is the cell membrane. This is the inside of the cell. This is the outside of the cell. Here this is this amyloid precursor protein, and when it gets chopped up by these enzymes called secretases, it forms amyloid and amyloid plaques. Uh, and so um, we think that there are drugs, and actually there are drugs being developed to inhibit these enzymes. Some of these enzymes actually uh, resemble the protease, you may have heard of HIV uh, protease inhibitors, and we have drugs like this that block amyloid uh, production. We also have uh, vaccines and other immune mechanisms that we think may help to, to uh, clear these uh, sticky amyloid proteins out of the brain.
And finally, we are starting to think more and more about this other protein called tau, which may in the long run be a better uh, target for Alzheimer's drugs. Not only that, but uh, as Dr. Seeley told you, about 50% of frontotemporal dementia is probably caused by tau uh, abnormalities. And we think that these drugs may also help patients with frontotemporal dementia. And conversely, we think that testing the drugs in patients with frontotemporal dementia may be a quicker way to, to determine whether we can cure uh, human dementia than by testing them in Alzheimer's disease. So I want to just focus on these two uh, classes of drugs right now and tell you about a little of the, a little of the progress that, we're, that we've made here and elsewhere uh, using these types of drugs. So um, probably the leading uh, drug in uh, clinical trials right now for Alzheimer's disease is an antibody. So an antibody is something that your, bo that your uh, body naturally produces. It's a protein that the immune system, um, immune system produces to fight usually an infection, but we can actually uh, take amyloid, and so this amyloid uh, that accumulates in Alzheimer's disease, and we can uh, create antibodies that bind to uh, amyloid and clear it from the brain. And so uh, recently, about a couple years ago, uh, there was a study of about 300 people with this drug called bapinezumab that cleans amyloid out of the brain. And we found that although it didn't work for everyone with Alzheimer's disease, we could see that it did actually have beneficial effects in certain genetic subtypes. And so again, this is over 78 weeks. We're looking at people who got uh, a, a placebo or uh, just a saline solution infusion uh, versus in red versus people who got the bapinezumab or the drug infusion that cleans amyloid out of the brain in blue. And what you can see is that on some of these memory tests over time, the people who got the placebo declined a lot more than the people who got the bapinezumab. In fact, you get a sense that the decline was actually stabilized. And we think that this was actually related to the clearing uh, or the prevention of buildup of more amyloid in the brain. Um, as Dr. Rabinovici told you now, we can use more sophisticated imaging tools, and this is the Pittsburgh compound B that he told you about that binds to amyloid in the brain. And during this bapinezumab study, uh, a subset of the patients actually got brain scans with uh, Pittsburgh compound B, both at the beginning and th at the end of the study. And what you can see in the top two panels are patients who were treated with the drug uh, and you can see at baseline, all this red was amyloid in the brain. And then after 78 weeks, so this is over a year, uh, when we would expect if you have Alzheimer's disease, you'd be building up more amyloid, you can see that there was less red. Same with this patient. So at the beginning of the study, there's a lot of this toxic red amyloid here. But by the end of 78 weeks of treatment, there was actually less of that. And so we take this as evidence that the drug was removing amyloid from the brain. By comparison, the patients who got the placebo, many of them accumulated more amyloid. So you can see at the beginning, there wasn't a whole lot of red in the front part of the brain here in this patient, but by the end, there was more amyloid. Same goes for this patient. Um, so at the beginning, there wasn't much amyloid, but by the end, there was more amyloid. And so this is consistent with some of the stabilization that we saw in the memory uh, function with this drug. I think that uh, although we were encouraged by these results, um, there have actually has been some big failures, unfortunately, with other amyloid drugs recently. And even though um, in this slide here we saw that many of these patients actually we were able to measure a change on their brain imaging scan that showed we were, we were removing the amyloid from their brain. Unfortunately, when we measured their memory, it didn't actually improve, or in some of these people, it didn't even stabilize. So their memory continued to get worse, even though we were removing the amyloid. And so this has led to the question um, that, uh, you know, are we using these amyloid therapies too late or is possibly amyloid not the right target for a treatment that's going to cure Alzheimer's disease?
Um, and so again, this is, a, this is an, uh, an image that's similar to what Dr. Abinovici told you but, uh, earlier, that we think that amyloid builds up very early in the course of Alzheimer's disease. So here's an amyloid plaque. And we think it starts to accumulate while people are still cognitively normal. But by the time you have this mild cognitive impairment, it's, you've, your brain is already chock full of the amyloid. And by the time you have Alzheimer's disease, it's really been there for a long time. And so it's a pretty tough target. On the other hand, this protein called tau tends to accumulate much later and correlate better with the, the complaints that people have in clinic. And so we think that um, tau doesn't accumulate till later, builds up during MCI and also during Alzheimer's disease. Right now, the, the clinical trials that have been done and the trial that I just showed you are using these anti-amyloid therapies very late in the course of the disease. It may be too late because this amyloid's been sitting in the brain for 10 or 20 years, and at that point, the damage may be done. It may be that, am, that the tau is the more relevant uh, target. So. Um, what I want to just tell you about very briefly is that we're also developing uh, anti-tau drugs, and it may be that these will be more promising for people who actually already have symptoms. The other approach that people are taking is to try and use these anti-amyloid drugs, which we have just, which I just showed you, we think can remove amyloid from the brain, but use them much earlier when it's not so late in the course of the disease, so that maybe they might actually work better. I couldn't resist because Dr. Seeley was showing you a picture of networks, um, that this is our uh, UCSF-led uh, uh, frontotemporal dementia treatment network that's uh, going on right now uh, in three continents around the world. And uh, we are uh, leading a study with this drug called Davunatide, which we think is stabilizing the microtubules. And so the hub, we think, for tau-related treatment uh, in the world, we hope, is going to be here in San Francisco, and, and we're proud to be doing that. So uh, we're also very active here with a variety of other treatment studies. Most of them are for Alzheimer's disease, but some are for frontotemporal dementia. I think we're going to see more and more frontotemporal dementia treatment studies in the future. Uh, these are some of the ones that are active. Uh, just to bring this back full circle, um, I am uh, eternally optimistic that very soon we're going to be much more successful at treating Alzheimer's disease. And we're going to do this by preventing Alzheimer's disease. So how is this going to work? Well, at age 50, just like you get a mammogram or you get a prostate-specific antigen test or a colonoscopy, it may be that we can do a brain scan or some other type of test that'll, that'll let you know whether you're in the earliest stages of Alzheimer's disease before you have any symptoms. One of these tests might be the brain scan that, that uh, Dr. Rabinovich uh, described to you earlier called Pittsburgh Compound B. So let's say you're age 50, you're totally normal, but your brain scan looks like you have a lot of this amyloid and it looks like you're on the way to getting Alzheimer's disease. Well, what we can do maybe is use a drug like bapinuzumab, maybe with some other drugs that act on tau, and hopefully if we give them to you at this stage before you have any memory problems, we'll be able to prevent you from developing mild cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's disease. Now, I know this sounds a little far-fetched, but I think it's not that far off, and I think there's good reason to believe we're going to be successful. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. I know it's getting late, and uh, this is our support.